Welcome to Fort Worth 148's podcast, where we meet to discuss Masonic topics and strive to build value in the Brotherhood. The opinions and statements of the participants do not represent any positions or stance of any Grand Lodge or Lodge, and are solely the viewpoints of the participants. Welcome back to the podcast, brothers. This is Rip Moore, past master and current secretary of Fort Worth 148. This is Billy Hamilton, uh, current junior warden for Fort Worth 148. This is Gabe Yagish, sitting senior deacon for Fort Worth 148, and we have a special guest today. This is Paul Rana of Austin Lodge 12. Sweet. Glad to have you, Paul. Glad to be here. I think it's kind of uh, unique that, I mean... We, I mean, I instantly knew we got to have this guy on the show. Of course. <laughs> we met, what was it, in October last year? Um, I believe we met, yes, we met at a banquet at Austin 12, actually. Yeah. And mm-hmm. you were, you, uh, John Bringle was doing a 101 class and you took over for it. And between the two of you guys, it was like, uh, yeah, we got to have him on the show, which John's going to be on the show in a couple of weeks as well. That guy is a, a ball of energy and a very youthful man. <laughs> he is something else. Yeah, that was really intriguing. So we're glad to have you on. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me here. For our listeners that, for any of our listeners that don't know, Paul is going to be one of our speakers for uh, Texas Masonicon 2019. And we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, later on in the show. But he's kind of our first uh, unveiled speaker. Before we get into the meat of the show, uh, we're going to have a discussion question, and Billy brought this to our attention. It's a uh, question that was posted in the subreddit for Freemasonry. And we know that's trouble when it's from Reddit. Yeah, you know, of course. <laughs> but you know, and we consider that fair game because we like to kind of roundtable these. Yeah. Uh, so the if the post is titled "Dilemma for Discussion: Does This Guy Go East?" Uh, Hypothetical, inspired by true events, names have been changed to protect the innocent. Situation, brother so-and-so is sitting in the south in your lodge as a plural member. He's old enough to remember the Summer Olympiad in Helsinki. Uh, He's a cancer survivor and received a double lung transplant four and a half years ago. Life expectancy after double lung transplant is approximately five years. So-and-so keeps getting left behind in his home lodge because he has a Swiss cheese memory for ritual. He is sitting as junior deacon in that lodge for the third year in a row. He joined your lodge a year ago because he likes the guys and likes the things that the lodge does, but also because it's heart's desire to be a past master and sees your lodge as the best chance to accomplish this. Elections happen next month and the brethren are talking. Position one, put brother so-and-so in the east. Yeah, he half remembers ritual, but the chaplain and the other officers can pick up that slack and help the guy out. He probably isn't long for this world. He's a good guy. Let's give the guy what he wants. Let's let him go to his grave with a PM apron. No harm, no foul, right? Position two. Sitting east is not to be taken lightly. It should be the position, person who can best be, do the job. There's a reason he keeps getting passed over in his home lodge. Lodge is like theater camp. Everyone has a role, but not everyone gets a leadership or starring role. Brother so-and-so hasn't paid his dues yet in, lo- in this lodge. A past master's apron isn't a participation trophy. So... In your opinion, do uh, you send this guy east? <laughs> That's a horrible question. <laughs> uh, I, I, I wouldn't. Yeah. I mean, wh- what's the point of adding that stress on him? You yeah. know, because he's not going to be able to perform the job with as much health issues as they described in that. What seems like <laughs> crazy you know, scenario. I mean, a guy that just got a double lung transplant and he's like going, telling everybody he wants to be master. I don't know. Maybe he's a go getter. Yeah. Well, what he, and he joined your lodge. Cause yeah, he likes the guys, but like he also sees it as an opportunity. Jeez. I feel like that kind yeah, that, of devalues the lodge. <laughs> yeah. That comes off kind of, kind of wrong. And I, so I, look through some of the answers on here and I kind of agree with some of the guys who said if he's a capable leader and inspires others, you know, if he has some problems with ritual, I guess it really depends on how bad those problems are. Um, you know, 
there, there's always someone who can help him a little bit. But I mean, from what it sounds like, I, I would not progress the guy to the East. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, not necessarily because, uh, you know, it, it would be a toll on his health or anything like that. But I think, you know, we've seen before what what happens if you have someone who doesn't really know how to lead. Um, you know, it, it can be a detriment that takes a year or more to recover from. Uh, you know, you have to think about not only this guy's wishes, but also the help it's going to leave Lodge in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Agreed in all points. Um, number one, that is definitely a terribly worded question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Both scenarios are just absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> Take it to the nth degree. But um, yeah, if they're, if you join that lodge specifically for that person, for that purpose, that shows some strange motives off the bat. Mm-hmm. But that Reddit comment that what if he's a good leader and can inspire others? That's definitely something to consider in the sense that in Masonry, the actual sitting master doesn't have to do all the initiations. And in that sense, if he can inspire leadership and bring people together, that's one thing. But overall, I would probably stick with not sending him to the East. Yeah. And then my, you know, I actually commented in that thread and, and my uh, answer to that whole post was verbatim. This is a terrible idea. Don't send him to the East. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's pretty simple, but you know, obviously in our jurisdiction, Texas, we have, we lucked out because, you know, we don't have to have sitting masters to confer things, but there are a lot of jurisdictions where, you know, sitting master or sitting officer has to sit in that chair for that degree every time, uh, if they're present, which they should be. Um, Uh so it may not apply in their case, but even in Texas, I would say kind of my, my basic qualification is, Hey, you should be able to do some ritual, right? Like if if you have to be, if you have to be helped with everything, then you're not meeting the base qualifications for leadership of a Masonic lodge. Right. And that's that I know not everybody shares that opinion and that's fine. But to me, um, the way we open lodge, the way we close lodge and the catechisms that we teach to the candidates are an instruction manual for the various aspects of Freemasonry. So I'm not saying everybody has to be perfect, but you know, Hey, like, you know, you gotta be able to be competent at least. And well, and that is why certificates are important. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, part of the way we inspire is the way we do that ritual as officers. And, you know, if you can't do the ritual, well, you can still inspire people. You just got a much bigger hill to climb. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it, being able to make that impact on a candidate or even on your fellow officers is important because you should, exactly. uh, especially when you open up the master's lodge and you close the master's lodge, uh, th- the way that that is done can be very meaningful. And if you're not having an impact on people when you do that, then you know, maybe you need to rethink what you're doing. But right. I, I, the big thing, my big takeaway was from this post was the treating of the past master's title like a participation trophy. Um, mm-hmm. And something like something that everybody deserves. Uh, because let's be real, not everybody deserves to be a past master or, or a sitting master, however you, you know, you want to phrase that. Right. Yeah, and that everybody should be a past master. I, I hear a lot of times, oh, well, it's their time. Um, you know, again, you have to take, you know, what kind of lodge are they going to leave behind after their year's done? Yeah. And there's so many ways to serve in, in the lodge. Master is not the only way to inspire. Master is not the only way to, le- to lead and to serve. So right. one of the beautiful things about masonry is that everyone can find their niche. They can <clears> find <throat> what they're good at. Go down. I think one That's of the kind mo- of the point. One of the most inspiring guys in our lodge, uh, to me at least, is Ritt's dad, uh, Billy Moore, who, uh, without fail, he goes and he sits with all the prospective members um, outside of the lodge, uh, dur- sometimes during stated meetings, not always, but a lot of times during degrees, if we have you know, somebody sitting in his usual parts or whatever, and he'll go and he'll sit out there, and he knows by the time these guys apply to be masons he knows all of them backwards and forwards better than anybody 
including the investigation committee, because he's been sitting with them and he knows these guys. And to me, that's very inspiring. So, you know, and, you know, yes, he's a past master of our lodge, but, you know, he's no longer in active leadership. But it also shows that you don't need to be in active leadership to make a huge difference. So, mm -hmm. um, well, I think we got some good mileage out of that question. <laughs> so we'll uh we'll reintroduce the guest and subject so tonight's uh or today's or whenever you're listening to this podcast this episode's subject is a fraternal spotlight on brother paul rana and uh, his official bio is uh brother paul edward rana has been a member of austin lodge number no. 12 since 2007 and a member of the austin scottish rite since 2008 he writes and lectures internationally on Kabbalah, alchemy, Rosicrucianism, Gnosticism, Hermeticism, and initiatory bodies of the Western esoteric tradition. As a translator, author, and editor, he has published over 20 volumes on French hot grade masonry and related esoteric currents. And then I added this bit. He is also a fifth Don black belt master in multiple schools of martial arts with 25 years of martial arts and fitness training involvement and 15 years of teaching experience. So, again, Paul, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. And, and, and th it's glad to be here. And where did you find that last part? <laughs> <laughs> Gabe, he can get into the recesses of the internet. <laughs> I have my ways, such as your publicly accessible martial arts schools website. <laughs> wow. The, uh, okay. <laughs> let's just say I like to do my research. But Paul, that looks like Paul, can you tell us a little bit about yourself outside of the Masonic lens? Well, uh, as you put there, um, I'm a martial artist. That's one of my, my main passions and drives in life. Um, the big things I focus on these days are martial arts, esotericism. Um, my fiance, we're soon to be married in June. Um, and just trying to raise the consciousness and be a part of this beautiful experiment we call life and this journey that we're all on. Right on. Fantastic. So how old and uh, how old were you when you joined? Cause it, well, you joined in 2007. Isn't that what your bio mm -hmm. said? Yes, sir. So how, how old were you? So I joined at 21. Um, is Texas law now 18 or is it still, is it, it 21? It is now That's 18. Right. right. It's now 18. So when I was growing up, you know, as far as masonry, what drew me to the organization, um, <clears throat> I've been studying philosophy and comparative religion since I was a kid. And I was extremely blessed to be involved in a gifted program growing up through public school system. But what it meant was I had the exact same teacher for four years in a row. She was like the special, special and gifted education. They called it SAGE. Um, because I had, this, yeah, and it was, I had the same teacher for four years. Um, and because of where we were at, she was able to kind of change the curriculum up from state standards. Uh, I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona, by the way. Okay. Um, so we spent, for example, third grade, we spent the entire year of third grade studying Greek mythology. And not only studying it, but we acted out plays. So I have videos of myself in third grade at the Equinox dressed in a gold cape with a crown and it's Jupiter king of the gods as as they all come up and tell you each god tries to tell you which god's most important you know like the god of sun the god of wind the god of water and you know the king in his infinite wisdom decides to create the equinox so that all things have their time and space um so this teacher this elementary school teacher led us through greek mythology in third grade Fourth grade, we went into Roman mythology, did the same thing, acted out plays on each of these deities and their rites. And then fifth and sixth grade, studied the seven chronicles of Narnia. So before you're even in middle school, you've already studied Greek, Roman, and Christian mysticism. That's amazing. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah, she was a cool, really cool teacher. And I'm pretty sure she was, she was a witch. <laughs> like an actual witch? That's cool. Yeah, I'm pretty sure she was a Wiccan. Wow. <laughs> That's crazy, man. I actually, in that. Teach us really cool stuff. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I, I lived in Phoenix for a couple of years, and that would not surprise me because I know they have a very strong Wiccan community there. It's true, yeah. So you're so saying with, that's with where that, the weird people are. <laughs> well, that yeah. and yeah, and, <laughs> keep Phoenix weird. So with that, you know, um, I just kept studying philosophy and comparative religion as a kid. Um, I wanted to join masonry when I discovered it at 18, but at the time, I believe in Arizona, you had to be 21. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. I moved to mm-hmm. Texas right before my 21st birthday, mm-hmm. and I went down the lodge on my birthday and you know, met Brother John Brangle, met people like Victor Armstrong, and just got involved as soon as I could. Nice. I mean, was there anything in particular uh, that drew you to Austin 12? Uh, mostly it was the, the proximity that it happened to be you know, mm-hmm. in Austin where I lived. And yeah. I lived on the north side, but, you know, I just felt I could rap with these guys right away. Yeah. I was looking well. specifically for esotericism and for philosophy and spirituality. Um, things that I felt I hadn't found in the, the mainstream world so much. And I just felt like that fit was there. I was going to say, you hit the jackpot. If that was the first lodge you visited. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Other than Glendale, it was on. <laughs> That's amazing, <laughs> though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because, you know, you, especially what John Bringle brings to the table, as little as I know of him, um, you're not going to get that in most Masonic lodges nowadays. Yep. So you, 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 fate stepped in or something. You walked into a... <laughs> the perfect situation can, yes sir and i can definitely say that i've been extremely blessed in my life and humbled and honored just for all the opportunities and great teachers organizations and mentors that have been around um and that just teaches us to turn around and do the same thing for the next generation yeah yeah that's awesome so I know, so, oh so, uh, so i know rit knows a little bit about your lodge but can you tell us a little bit about your lodge yeah it's an old one I know that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very oh, yeah. Number 12. <laughs> <laughs> Number 12. <laughs> and we're actually a Republic of Texas lot. Ah, jealous. Yeah, that's great, man. And we're proud of it. Um, you know, in that vein, I never, growing up in Phoenix, I didn't know what to think about Texas growing up, you know, and I wasn't very excited to move here when I first did, but I fell in love with it immediately. Um, just... The rivers, the countryside, the hill country, and the Texas independent spirit, you know? Yeah. Um, and we love that at 12, that we're a Republic of Texas Lodge, uh, that we were chartered when Texas was its own country. Um, the first meeting of AFNA and Masonry was in Austin on October 11th, 1839. And that was a week before President Lamar uh, came into the town to establish the government. Oh, cool. So the lodge was established before the government. <laughs> um, I dig it. Uh, which is very common as lodges spread westward in that mm-hmm. expansion uh, across the states. Uh, the meeting was at a guy named Edwin Waller at his home, and 14 Master Masons gathered to uh, create the petition to form the lodge. And that was formed less than a month later on November 7, 1839. That's cool. Oh. We have a saying uh, sometimes in Texas that uh, everyone is a Texan. Some people just get here faster than others. During that time from like 1840, uh, you know, the beginning of Austin 12, they hosted Grand Lodge, I think six, something like six times. Um, and they were, they were pretty pivotal in a lot of the establishment of the government of the state and the capital. You know, they laid the, the cornerstones for UT, um, the Capitol building, I believe, uh, the courthouse, all kinds of things. Oh, Wow. Yeah, that's back when lodges used to lay cornerstones as opposed to Grand Lodge does them all now. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So uh, what would you say is your favorite aspect of masonry and why? My favorite aspect of masonry would be definitely the, the doors that can open for you. And I don't mean that in the sense that some people in the outside world think as far as like ambition and uh, opportunity, but I mean, the doors that can open to your mind, to your spirit, and to your inner world, the doors that it can open to uh, philosophy, 
to comparative religion and to understanding the history and nature of humanity. No, I was going to say, I think that's a good point because uh, how we are so accepting, it kind of forces you to open your minds to, to other things, especially, you know, religion and that we accept all religions, you know. Yeah. Well, I would say the institution is accepting. I don't know about individual Masons. <laughs> oh, well, no, no. Yeah, nobody's perfect. Don't, don't right. get me started there. Just you. No, but, but any opportunity yeah. you have to, to burst through your, your personal social bud, you know, bubble is, is a good opportunity to uh, kind of improve yourself. So that's one thing I, I like about masonry, too. Yeah, oh, I mean, because you get stuck in your own little world, your own little bubble. Because, I mean, my best friend and I, we're best friends because we think alike. You know, everything he likes, I like just about. And masonry kicks me out of that comfort zone like that. That's true. And it opens, it opens a lot of possibilities. You know, I joined masonry because I was looking for something to teach me the ancient mystery schools because they didn't seem to be around anymore at that time. Um, you know, education, fraternity, the, the, the friendships I've gained in masonry are the lifelong bonds you can never find anywhere else just about. You know, my best friend who uh, basically brought me into masonry, he was the, my mentor through the grades. He's going to be the, uh, the bishop presiding at my wedding in six months. To oh, his nice. Sister. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Oh, that is interesting. It, it is a unique, it's a unique fraternity, you know, because like you say, I mean, we met, you know, in October and I already, you know, just from being in the fraternity together, you already have that bond that just like catapults you to a new level of friendship. Instantly. And you can meet yeah. people from around the world. When you travel to foreign countries and you go and visit Masons, there's that instant connection or at least the opportunity for a connection. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. The way that I liken it is uh, kind of like being back in high school or college when it was really easy to make friends in high school or college or whatever because everybody has to be there in the same place and you all kind of have the same general goal go get educated go graduate you know uh and yeah. in freemasonry you know you're all expected to be there you all kind of have the same general goal of i want to be a better man than i was yesterday and uh so you 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 have the same leg up as as opposed to the adult world where you have to go out and work and find your own friends and stuff, which I mean, I'm not, I don't want to make us out to sound like losers, but I mean, just like, Hey, it's a lot easier to make friends if you're a Mason. <laughs> so good ones too. Yeah. Yeah. Paul, Quality. Uh, what do you see as the strengths and weaknesses of Texan Masonry? I think that our foundation in Texas as being a, a sovereign state, at least for a period of time is a definite strength to that Masonic spirit. Um, yeah. and that's that's a unique thing about Texas and I, I go to other jurisdictions you know when I'm in Germany hanging out there they're like we like you Texans you guys like guns and meat <laughs> <laughs> guns and barbecue I like that it's a very good summary yeah. of Texas yeah. uh -huh. and you know I was hanging out in Bavaria and they're like you know we're, we're Bavarians first just like you guys are Texans first mm -hmm. and they're they're European second and they're Germans last, perhaps something like that. <laughs> um, so I think that that national identity and just like the, the spirit of independence and progress is a real strength to Texas masonry. Fantastic. P Paul, what do you think uh, the best ways for us as a fraternity to improve would be? Education, education, education. <laughs> um, whether it's individuals reading the thousands of books that have been published over the thousands of years <laughs> of Masonic related history, or it is conversing with, uh, well, with, with knowledgeable brothers, or it mm -hmm. is going to lectures or giving lectures or going and there's so many avenues for education. And I think that mm -hmm. is, um, absolutely paramount. So if you don't mind me following up on that, um, you know, there are, tons of different education, you know, Masonically that we can take advantage of. Uh, is there one particular, I guess, flavor of education or, or topic that you think um, more people should, should definitely get interested in? 
If I could say one thing that I think everyone that is a Mason should study, it would be the Kabbalah. <clears throat> the Kabbalah. Because in my opinion, uh, yes, in my opinion, the Kabbalah is the one of the biggest root sources of Freemasonry. Um, we just had a, we have a group in Austin attached to the Austin Scottish Rite. We call it the Collegium, uh, the, Cle- the Collegium Ecosse, so the Scottish College. Mm-hmm. And we mostly get together twice a month. We meet for an hour and a half before stated meeting, and we meet for an eight-hour session on the last Saturday of the month. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> With a lunch break. But, uh, you know, we sat down and we just went over the fourth degree of the Scottish Rite without getting into things too much. We just get, we got into the basics of what Kabbalah is about. And we got into the writings of Albert Pike, the writings of Mackey and other people. Mm-hmm. And they clearly spell out that Kabbalah and Hermeticism are the foundational roots of Freemasonry and that they are essential to studying its mysteries. Interesting. Yeah, actually, and, and that is true because I remember reading Albert Pike's Esoterica, and he has a section where he talks all about the Kabbalistic influence in Blue Lodge craft masonry. Yes. Entirely. Entirely. So, um, so, Paul, what would you say keeps you motivated to keep you working in the quarries? Basically, being able to turn around and give the next generation the opportunities that were given to me. Um, to Not to harp on Kabbalah too much, but they have this... <laughs> <laughs> they have this teaching called of tikkun or restoration. Uh, you could also liken it to reintegration as a word that's used in other Masonic circles. But first thing you do with, um, with self-knowledge, with self-empowerment, uh, self-actualization is that you, you heal yourself, right? You, you restore yourself. And they call that tikkun ha-nefesh, restoration of the soul, of your own soul. And then you turn around. And you look at the world and you do tikkun ha olam, which means restoration of the world. So you heal yourself, you make yourself a worthy vessel of the light, and then you turn around and you give that same opportunity, that same healing, love and care to everyone else in the world and try to bring them back up as well with you. So I just want to give on to others what uh, has been given to me. And do our little part to heal the world one person at a time. Fantastic. You know, that's a really good point you bring up because, you know, that, that, that's kind of deep set in us as humans. If you've got that good gene in you, you want to help folks out. And we have a unique opportunity to do that in Freemasonry because these are vetted yeah. candidates that we know are good men that want to get better. Yeah. That would essentially heed the call if you needed them late at night, you know. Uh, and we get a chance to be a part of their growth and becoming better. And that's, that's a unique opportunity. I'm putting up my soapbox now, Gabe. (laughs) 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 And you know, that was the same ideal that the Rosicrucians spoke about in 1614 is the, their number one ideal was to heal the sick pro bono and Masonry does a fantastic job in the literal sense of healing the sick through things like all of our hospitals, the Scottish Rite Hospitals, the Shriner Hospital. But we also can consider healing the sick as in healing spiritual sicknesses or healing mental wounds or any other ways that we can help benefit our brothers around us. Yeah, I mean, because there's there's so many unique opportunities with that, too. I mean, because it could be something as simple as a phone call that you would have never made if this guy wasn't a member of your lodge. And that phone call changed his day, his week, his month. You know, and it, it just gives us opportunity. It bounds us with those kind of opportunities. It's kind of mm-hmm. cool to look at it in that, that way. So, Paul, can you tell us a little bit about your involvement with martial arts? So, uh, martial arts. I started training in martial arts when I was probably about five years old. <laughs> um, you know, my brother was taking Taekwondo, and he was my—he was the guy I looked up to, of course, right? You look up to your older brother. And yeah. He basically, 
he, he got me in, into uh, martial arts and heavy metal. <laughs> That's An what they're good combo. for. <laughs> they're kicking and slayer. <laughs> yeah, I, I, was awesome. hooked, man. I was hooked day one. I tried out. I tried out team sports. I did basketball. I did baseball. I did things like that. It was fun, but nothing challenged me or gave me the the drive and the the joy and the will like martial arts practice did. Um, you know, I've been studying since I was a kid. Um, started off in traditional karate. Uh, Kenpo Karate, and then moved on to Taekwondo. Studied that for the bulk of 15 years or so. And then I was, again, very blessed to have excellent tutors, excellent teachers, just like that that elementary school teacher that taught us philosophy. Uh, our teacher got us involved in boxing, kickboxing, full contact kickboxing, ground fighting, um, all kinds of different things to broaden your mind and get you not to be just in one specific system. <clears throat> um, so kept doing that, traveled around the world. By the time I was 13, I was teaching guest classes over in Hawaii when I was 18. <laughs> yeah. When I was 18, I was over in uh, Ireland winning my first uh, world championship and full contact kickboxing. Wow. And, you know, by the time I was 19, I had taught uh, both sides of both oceans and had run seminars in like four or five states and it was just my thing you know that and uh and music that and uh classical and jazz music kept me uh, out of trouble as a kid <laughs> i mean because that that's a full slate if you're doing all that i mean my son did judo for 10 years or so and it took us all over the united states that's a it's a busy schedule when you're serious into martial arts that's cool. It is busy. And I think that's good for kids. It teaches them things like time management, self-management, uh, goal setting and realization. Um, how to be, how to do public performing and public speaking. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those, those are the things that people really need, right? The things that they don't necessarily teach in school. Yeah. <clears throat> so what do you get most out of uh, through your involvement with martial arts? You know, Coming up through the grades, coming up through through the belts, there's, there's so many similarities. You talk about martial arts and masonry. <laughs> but coming up through the belts, it was physical fitness, focus, will, determination, all those kinds of things, right? Um, but at this point, as a, you know, in my early 30s and mostly focusing on teaching these days, it's, again, turning around to the next generation and trying to instill some inspiration, instill courage, the classical virtues, uh, things like modesty, courtesy, integrity, perseverance, self-control, and indomitable spirit, uh, classical virtues and values that are no longer necessarily inculcated in today's schools. Um, those kinds of mental disciplines, along with, you know, I sneak in some spiritual practices here and there. <laughs> you know, I have my, uh, my, my students study things like the I Ching, uh, of classical Taoism and stuff like that. Nice. Yeah, and then making people strong so they don't they don't get picked on, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, there's something to that. You know what I mean? Because if you have that confidence, you usually don't even get picked on. It's like an aura mm -hmm. about you. Yeah, so many schools focus on like you're going to be not get picked on because you can fight. But yeah. In my opinion, that's a that's a byproduct. Like being able to fight and self-defense is a byproduct of the spiritual, mental practices you're learning through this discipline. Yeah. No, you know, and when we're 80 years old, we're not going to be jumping doing 540 spin kicks, but we will. <laughs> <laughs> but we will be able to rock on the virtue. Exactly. It's interesting. So we, I guess, we kind of touched on then what similarities you see between martial arts and Freemasonry. You know, I find myself speaking Masonically so often in like a, a yoga class or in a in a martial arts class. I'm like, all right, let's all go put on our regalia. <laughs> <laughs> make make sure that's centered properly. You know, just make sure everything's <laughs> on correctly. There, there's a lot of similarities, and I think that's because masonry is truly universal. Mm -hmm. um, just like we know, we've all met masons, or we've We've met people who are Masons that have never been initiated into Masonry, but they're Masons in spirit. 
Yes. Um, the martial arts carries that same spirit of respect, all those virtues we talked about earlier. Um, and the way that it teaches you in degrees or in belts, you know, you gradually come to a, a greater knowledge. Mm -hmm. Just like in masonry, people join martial arts for all kinds of reasons, right? Some people want to get tough. Some people want to not be bullied. Some people might have bad intentions with it. But anyone that truly goes through the whole process and goes through a five, 10 year experience will come out the end transformed mm -hmm. and it will be a better person for it. So would you say that the, the martial arts, you know, by mastering the physical helps you to also master the spiritual and mental and maybe vice versa? Most definitely. And I think that masonry should do the same thing, you know, just like the practice of yoga, working through your body, uh, which the Kabbalists would call the, the nefesh, the guf, working through your body, working through earth allows you to start opening up your mind and your, your uh, ruach, your, your soul, so that eventually you can tap deeper into the spirit of all things, the oversoul, the sophia. Um, nature and get yourself more in tune, not just with yourself, but with the things around you. I was going to say, we're swimming in the deep end now. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, what's the most challenging thing you encounter regularly as a teacher or and or practitioner of the martial arts? Martial arts is, I mean, obviously there's, there's the surface uh, challenges, right? You're, you're fighting. So there's challenges like getting punched in the face. <laughs> Unpleasant. And, you know, yeah, we're some. <laughs> but, um, and there's challenges for, for every belt level. My students, they have different challenges, right? Um, at this level, it's you got to got to jump and do those 540 spin kicks to get your next belt. <clears throat> but I find that the biggest challenge is working with um, teenagers or preteens who are in that stage where they're not quite ready to turn on they're not ready to, ready to click on in high gear they've kind of entered that passive state of teenager dumb and i want to try to help navigate that those that weird time i want to help them navigate and find that internal fire that inspiration so that they do something really positive during high school um so in, in a nutshell in a word the hard the the biggest challenge is inspiring inspiring children and helping them to get out of their shell and be confident Yeah, that is a tough one. I can. My wife's a teacher, and she struggles with the same thing. And at the same time, karate is one of the best ways to do it. You know, um, <clears throat> I gave a presentation at Texas State a few years ago, and these in front of entrepreneurs, a business plan presentation. And at the end of it, they one of them said a comment, and he said that that's actually the guy whose name's on the, the building. <laughs> he said, "Well, hey, we outsource everything else in our life." Why shouldn't we outsource teaching our kids virtue, discipline, and confidence? Oof. Wow. <laughs> I hate that so much. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know what I mean? Because there comes that point when, when kids are 14, 15, they don't necessarily listen to mom and dad the same way, right? No. And maybe that teacher can get through to them in a different way. Oh, man. But the way that that's phrased is just like, ugh. Yeah. That, that, that's coming from a, a business yeah yeah from a guy who went to school yes <laughs> i guess you can tell Whew. so why is it important for martial artists to practice um, forms such as the kata <clears throat> so it, kata kata so for people who don't know what katas are katas are uh pre-arranged sequences of motions they are they start off extremely simple, like walking in a square while doing certain blocks uh, or making a cross with your body motions, doing blocks and punches. Um, but they evolve into very complex circular motions um, in which the person learns the tools of the art. And I think that cod is important because it is the way that the arts have always been taught. You know, sparring was not necessarily the main practice up until very recently. 
you know, Bruce Lee was one of the first guys to introduce full contact sparring in like 67, 69, something like that, the Long, the Long Beach tournament. <clears throat> it's always been taught through repetitive, you know, monkey see, monkey do. The master does the kata and you follow along beside him. But that's only the surface. I think that the kata is important because just like we talked about the body, mind, spirit aspect, through kata, you're able to hone your body, hone the tools there, but then focus your mind and eventually, hopefully, tap into your spirit in which you enter what we call flow state, right? That's a great term, flow state, from modern business schools that we didn't have a thousand years ago, you know, or even a hundred years ago, flow state. You enter that flow state in which inspiration occurs. And um, that's, kata is my main gig, you know, fighting is my thing growing up, especially in my 20s. But nowadays, kata is the thing that's the most important to me, and that's what I enjoy the most. That's cool. Hmm. So, the curriculum of your school, uh, Prana Martial Arts, draws from Taekwondo, Karate, Kaju Kenbo, Judo, Jiu Jitsu, traditional boxing, kickboxing, and yoga. Uh, of those disciplines, or maybe one that I didn't mention, which would you say comprises the bulk or foundation of Prana Martial Arts? The bulk or foundation would be traditional Taekwondo and Karate. And <clears throat> Those, those words can get very conflated. It can mean a lot of different things. But I, I stick to the traditional, meaning the old school, pre-1950s versions of karate and taekwondo. Um, I think those are the foundational things that kids start with that teaches you body awareness, teaches you foundational stance, teaches you inner strength. And then as they progress through the grades or the belt levels, see, degrees, <laughs> they uh, – they start to pick up boxing, so American boxing becomes a thing, and that's when they start to spar more, kickboxing, things like that. And then as they progress a little more, they get to judo. We start throwing people on the ground. Um, as they progress a little more, they get into ground fighting and grappling. And then as a black belt, they're supposed to be able to integrate all of it into one fluid system. So in the essence, prana martial arts, the foundation of it, <clears throat> is spirit, prana in the name. <clears throat> and my, that's, it's, a, it's, it's a play in my name, Paul Rana, prana. Yeah. <laughs> it's also a Sanskrit word. It means breath, spirit, or life. <clears throat> and it's a, it's a term used in yoga and in Hinduism a lot, but you don't see it a lot in the West. <clears throat> uh, the yoga plays into that, and the name is based on that to show our yogic influence, that everything I teach, I want to be holistic, balanced and very conscious um one reason a lot of middle-aged and older individuals will come to me is because they want to get training that will work on their flexibility because as we get older it's not important that you be able to fight it's important that you're able to get out of bed without your back hurting <laughs> 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 things like that <clears throat> so I, I would say the spirit is the most important part of it you know it starts with karate but Yoga and um, that consciousness is what I'm trying to create as the foundation of my system. Okay. So in your words, then, what is yoga? Because I noticed you had a little section on that on your website that you de dedicated a little bit more talking time to it. What do you define as yoga um, and how is that important uh, in addition to everything else? Yoga can be a lot of things. Um, when most people think of yoga in the West, we think of uh, tight spandex and sweaty bodies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds all good, man. I'm cool with that. You know? <laughs> my, my, fiance, my fiance is a yoga instructor. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but um, yoga means union. And it has the same meaning as the root yoke, to yoke, to unite, um, which is used in the New Testament a lot with uh, Christ regarding uh, bringing his brethren together in union. So yoga, in my sense, and what, how I understand it, what I'm trying to put forth, is it is the art of uniting the self. It is the art of 
through the body, through the mind, through the breath, through the spirit, finding that inner union first within, like we said before, tikkun ha nefesh, and then outwards, tikkun ha olam. So reintegrate yourself, then turn around, re- help reintegrate the world. And, um, you know, on, on one level, yoga is a really great stretching practice. It keeps you, keeps you happy and healthy. <clears throat> on another level, it teaches you how to get into meditational breath work that will allow you to get into a true meditative state and eventually transcend levels of consciousness. <clears throat> and on the final ultimate sense, it is a symbol for uh, enlightenment and for the royal secret, as I like to call it. Whoa, cool. So how many kinds of, so you've mentioned a couple of different, um, I guess, schools of thought on yoga, and you mentioned a bunch of different um, types of yoga on your website. Uh, how many kinds of yoga and what kinds of yoga do you teach at Prana Martial Arts? So as far as kinds of yoga, the, the thing is, nowadays when you go to a yoga studio, mm-hmm. everything you're going to see is hatha yoga. Hatha meaning of the body, physical asanas, practices. Now, you're going to go there, you're going to see power yoga, vinyasa flow, gentle yoga. Those are all hatha, okay? So I teach hatha yoga for fitness classes of all types, you know, restoration, power, things like that. But the thing that I really like to focus on is what I call raja yoga. And raja yoga, raja means king or kingly. And it is the royal yoga. It is basically Asian alchemy. It is basically yoga, al- alchemical yoga. And that is where... Whoa. Yeah, dude. Yoga is a lot crazier than people think it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyone who wants to get in on that should pick up a book by Aleister Crowley called The Eight Limbs of Yoga. Oh. <clears throat> and he goes through the, the steps of sitting down and meditating all the way up to what they what is called samadhi in the yoga tradition. Samadhi meaning complete union in which self and other dissolve. <clears throat> wow. So that's kind of like reintegration almost. It is the exact same thing. <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> well, it, and that's cool because um, Alistair Crowley, I know a lot of people know him a lot of times with a negative connotation, but what isn't brought up is as often was that, especially in his younger years, he was very much a physical person. He was a mountain climber, uh, and, and he did go to India, and he did learn these techniques of yoga. So that's, that's cool. That's something I, I, you know, I often see overlooked, you know, not to say that I agree with every single thing he did, but he did have a lot of manuals. And not only talked about, uh, like, ritual magic, but it did talk about more yogic practices. Oh yeah, and he totally. I mean, he Curly is no no saint, <laughs> but uh, he, he's he's an interesting guy. With people should look into if they're interested in esotericism. His yoga yeah. texts are very interesting for sure. He was a uh, he was one of the first to bring yoga to the West. <clears throat> so, kind of in in terms of searching for knowledge and searching for teachers, uh, what's the best way to search for a martial arts school to enroll in, and how do you vet a martial arts instructor? Because I've I I grew up doing martial arts as a kid, and I've I've had good teachers and I've had bad teachers. Yes, sir. Likewise, and um, and that's a that's a tough thing, you know. Um, you want to first of all find what you're most interested in. Just like when people say, "What kind of spiritual tradition should I look into?" or "What what form of esotericism?" You know, start with what you're naturally inclined to. You know. If you don't like rolling around on the ground and like having people sweat on you and be really close, then don't do jujitsu. <laughs> <You know? laughs> if you don't like getting punched in the face, don't do boxing. <laughs> you know, um, so first know thyself, right? Yeah. No food ipsum. And then from there, once you start going out, you should, that person should make you feel comfortable. Um, you should feel like they are someone that you can trust. Um, and you should feel like hopefully that they're inspired and that they're not just, they're not just doing it for a paycheck. Right. Um, it's a really tricky thing. You can, you can try to vet someone on the internet with their ads and things like this, 
but I think it's really something you have to feel out and go and experience. Um, most schools will allow a trial period of at least coming in for a class or two to check it out, talk to the people around you, you know, look up on the internet, things like that. Um, but in the end, you really have to see what feels best for you. And if after a few months it doesn't work out, move on to the next place. You know, you're not, you're not in it for life yet. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> yet. <laughs> so shifting subject wildly, we've talked about your involvement <laughs> in martial arts and as a teacher. Uh, let's talk a little bit about kind of your um, wheelhouse as a writer, translator, and lecturer. Uh, let's talk about French Halgrad masonry and the other Western initiatic traditions that uh, you write and talk about. Um, kind of starting with the first thing I mentioned, uh, the world of French high-grade masonry is pretty big. So what do you define as Halgrad masonry and, and what are the areas that you focus on within that uh, subject? So Oh God, uh, Freemasonry or, or the high grades, anything beyond master Mason, um, is basically anything that has to do in, in, in continental. That would be York, right? That would be Scottish, right? You know, technically perhaps you could even say the shrine because it is beyond master Mason. Um, I got interested in the Oak Grads because of my interest in esotericism and spirituality. Um, Oak grads are things like the Scottish degrees, the English, the Ecosse degrees, the French Templar degrees, um, and all the fringe orders that came around from the 16, 17, 1800s, ranging from Martinism to the Golden Dawn to <clears throat> the SRIA, that, which is a legal Masonic branch, um, and the, you know, to Memphis Mitzraim, Memphis, high degree Freemasonry is basically those degrees beyond Master Mason, which seek to either show deeper mysteries of the Haramic myth or to go into the other origins of Masonry, albeit wh whether it's alchemical, Rosicrucian, Egyptian, Chaldean, Gnostic, uh, it is... Oat Grad is basically an umbrella for all those kinds of things. So it's a pretty big world then. It's, it's, uh, I guess you would describe it as anything, everything except for Blue Lodge Masonry or Craft Lodge Masonry. So that's kind of exactly that's it's a pretty Masonic world. body beyond craft. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which there have been a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. I guess the one exception would be the Mark Masters degree because that's kind of a craft degree still. But, geez, that's big. Um, so can you tell us more about the uh, translation process that you're involved in? Because it said that, you know, you're involved with the translation and publishing of over 20 uh, books on, on Algrod Masonry. What's this look like for you? Are you, I'm assuming you're fluent in French? Um, I started French because of studying these things. Oh, and wow. It came to a point. Yeah, it, 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 it was just <laughs> a point where it's like, I'm not going to learn anymore. I don't <laughs> learn the language. Cart before the horse, indeed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And hey, Austin Community College, ACC, has some great language classes for like 200 bucks a semester. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, if cool. you put the work in, you'll get it, right? Yeah. Uh, right, right. So, this is all my, my fascination with Oak Rod Masonry and not just masonry, but the fringe orders that came out of it as well, came from, you know, my, my youth studying philosophy, studying comparative religion, joining masonry, and then wanting more after Master Mason. Um, you know, wanting to dive into, well, where did that come from? You know, where did that part of the Masonic myth come from? Where did this part of that Masonic myth come from? What do those pillars represent here? What does the number seven represent here? You know, what, what does the pentagram mean to these people? Et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and in that sense, I, I call masonry uh, the gateway drug. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the truth. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. You're like, oh, you're, yeah, you're coming in for some, you know, some fish fries. Cool. Come on in. <clears throat> Have you heard of the Kabbalah? 
<laughs> Gnosticism. St. <laughs> John's Lodge. Let's read some St. John the Evangelist and the Apostle. <laughs> you know? Um, so with that, you know, I just dived into other esoteric groups, Rosicrucian groups, Hermetic groups, um, alchemical, apostolica, Gnostic groups, and found that there were so many source texts not translated. Um, and getting involved with organizations and seeing that there's just more out there, started learning the language and started working on things. Um, at this point, I think I've 20 was just like a rough number. It's probably more like 25 or 30 at this point, but nice. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> Taking things like, let, let's keep it on the, on the purely Masonic level. You can throw back to the 1750s, 1760s, this guy in France named Martinez de Pasquale. Mm. Or his full name is, you ready for this? <laughs> Big mouthful. <laughs> Jacques de Livron, Joachim de la Tour de la Casa Martin de Pasquale. <laughs> <laughs> Call him yeah. Jake for short. <laughs> yeah, yeah Jake. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, you can call him Martinez, you know, Martinez de Pasquale. He was uh, born in. 1727, uh, probably Grenoble, France, but there's we don't really know. Mm. Um, this guy, he received a he inherited a Masonic patent from his father that was given by Prince Charles Stuart. Um, if you don't know who that is, he was the, the the great pretender to the throne, and he basically set himself up, up as Grand Master of all Masons over the earth. Oh, in 1738. Pretty sweet gig. Yeah, it's, it must be cool being a king of a country. <laughs> <laughs> Putting that on my bucket list. <laughs> yeah. But that, that patent gave Pasquale the right to uh, make lodges. And this guy, he was, he's been my main fascination, is he went around France founding, um, he founded like the first Ecosse Lodge in France. And then he started founding what he called Temple uh, uh, Cohen branches. Mm. Uh, Cohen is a Hebrew word for priest. It's the name of the priestly class. And then he started founding uh, Elu Ecosse, so elect Scottish branches. And he eventually created one of the first high degree systems or oak grad systems in France. And that means anywhere because <laughs> some of the first systems came out of France. Mm -hmm. um, you know, by 1770, by, by 1767, he had founded an entirely new order called the Elu Cohen. And there's tons of information on these groups that are available in French libraries, uh, manuscripts untranslated. So basically what I'm doing is I'm taking these manuscripts and going through them, typing them into French if they're not already typed up from a handwritten manuscript. Mm -hmm. and that's, the, that's the hard part, man, is when all you have is a handwritten manuscript from 1770. And it's not French. cursive. <laughs> that and ain't cursive French anymore. That's something else. French cursive, Yes. Yeah. Luckily, the cursive is pretty clean. Yeah, it's not like Russian cursive. That's brutal. Um, yeah, well, um, yeah, no way. The, so how <laughs> well, can, brother Joe Star? He's the Russian guy. <laughs> <laughs> so how can the average Joe Schmo buy a copy of one of your translations of high grade masonry stuff? At this time, most of my texts are not available to the public. Um, they're coming out to people who are members of these high grade uh, systems. Oh. Um, but looking at 2019, there's been this trend lately to publish documents. Um, and I'm not entirely sure where I stand on some of that. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, the Grand College of Rights publishes documents, mm -hmm. but they generally publish documents of orders that are not Defined, active. Yeah. yeah. There's been this trend lately, especially in America, to publish documents of esoteric orders. And I'm not really a fan of that. I think that if they're working, they should remain internal. Um, but looking to, in 2019, make some things like Louis-Claude de Saint-Martin's books available in English. Um, I've got a couple that I've done myself that will probably release soon. Um, perhaps a new translation of Pasquale's Reintegration of Beings, which is his, uh, his midrash, essentially, on the Old Testament. And some things like that. So right. if and people are interested in that, they can contact me and it'll happen soon. Yeah. So I, I know that um, our very excellent companion, uh, Pierce Vaughn, has already published 
uh, two of uh, Samartan's books and, and they're, they're pretty good. Um, although I would say that I only really understand about 50% of, of errors and truth, uh, at best. Um, but it's, it's so, and I know that a couple of years ago, uh, Arturo de Hoyos was involved in publishing some of the rectified Scottish right work as well. Um, mm-hmm. I cannot remember the name of the book, but yeah, you're right. There is an, there is an increasing trend, um, of that being published. Uh, and I think that's a train we can't really stop at this point. Yeah. And I think overall it's a good thing that more education's out there. I just am cautious about active orders. You know, right. the rectified Scottish right is extremely active in France and South America. Um, but we don't have it in America. So that gives American Masons an opportunity to see that, to see their craft degrees. Um, mm. But with orders like the Cohen, you know, these are high grade systems that are, you can't read it, just like in masonry. You can't read the degrees and experience the change, right? Yeah. You have to go through the process. And when we're dealing with high-grade systems that are explicitly mystical or magical or alchemical, those things can't be learned intellectually. And um, my position at this point is that I'm going to start – probably releasing some of the philosophical documents to the public and then the magical things will stay, you know, for actual practitioners. Right. And you've that already kind of mentioned this, but you know, so the average Freemason is going to encounter high grade masonry and mainstream for masonry, uh, mainstream Freemasonry through the appended bodies and all that, but they're not going to necessarily encounter the stuff that's being published right now or that is being circled in private uh, or that is being published in private circulation in any way. What I would say for, for, for the general Freemason who's just starting to investigate uh, high grade systems is to really dive into the Scottish Rite materials that De Hoyos has published. You know, like really dive into the Scottish Rite ritual monitor and guide into his annotated edition of morals and dogma, because Pike's Morals and Dogma is extremely underrated, in my opinion. Um, The chapter on Night of the Sun, Prince Adept, is basically like a two, three hundred page primer in the Kabbalah (laughs) and on like ceremonial magic. (laughs) That's written by Pike. (laughs) You know, there's there's plenty in there. Things like the 23rd degree, things like the 18th degree. There's plenty in there already in those appended bodies. But just understand that you're not necessarily going to learn it by going to meetings. It's going to be more your own personal study with those texts. Yeah. Or reaching out to groups like the Collegium in Austin, which meets twice a month. Or reaching out to go into a Guthrie uh, reunion and seeing the full degrees. Um, mm-hmm. The general Mason will find it through those if they're looking for it. So let's kind of touch on one of the subjects that you've mentioned. Um <laughs> Some of our listeners might have heard of Martinism as a form of Christian mysticism or esoteric Christianity. And my question is, in a nutshell, what is Martinism? But before you answer that, as per your suggestion, let's define the terms mystical, uh, mysticism, magic, and magical, and then talk about Martinism and what it is. Cool. Yeah. And, and like you said, you know, mystic, it's, it's Martinism is generally called a form of Christian mysticism or a school of Christian mysticism. But what does mystical mean? Um, again, going back to yoga as a, a way to attain union or attain oneness or reality enlightenment, you can posit that in the West, we have two forms of attainment. You have mystical or magical. Mystical would be that very much typified by Louis-Claude de Saint-Martin, the unknown philosopher. And that is the quiet entering into the heart of ourselves, entering into meditation until everything is extinguished except for the light of deity. So it is a process of inner delving to find the light. Whereas magic might be a more outward projected process, an active process as opposed to passive, an active process of invocation, of invoking angels, spirits, gods, 
um, so that you fill yourself up with the light. So there's nothing but light. I would say that mysticism is passive, magical is active. And uh, Martinism, as most people understand it, is a mystical school on the more passive end. Uh, it's a Christian school that seeks to reawaken in its initiates the knowledge of their origin and bring them to what they would call the, uh, the first estate. So man before his exile from the Garden of Eden. Okay. So, and these are obviously philosophical concepts. <laughs> so, uh, would you, I guess it'd be um, so when you read a lot of books on like magical systems and hermeticism, uh, I encounter where it talks about inner working versus outer working. I guess would it be accurate to say that mysticism is kind of, is inner working, whereas magic is the outer working that are referred to in some of these texts. I would, I would definitely say that's accurate in the broad sense of those terms. Um, okay. Magic can be directed inwardsly. We call that theurgy. And, but in general, that would be a, a good way to look at it, mm -hmm. definitely, inwards and outwards. Yeah. I would almost describe mysticism as the thought process and mindset and magic as the system of processes and outcomes. That's a good way to look at it. You, you can see magic as the the, uh, the technology, <clears throat> the interface, whereas mysticism is the intention. Hardware versus mysticism software? Is, uh, maybe. I'm, I'm not a total tech. Right? And then mysticism is like, why am I doing this? And you're, you're doing this to attain knowledge of God, knowledge of yourself, knowledge of the universe. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and within Martinism, it, there's a trick though. Like most people think it's just mystical, but there's actually three branches of Martinism. The original of Pasquale, which we touched upon earlier, was a legitimate Masonic body in the 1750s of France that um, originally conferred only upon master masons, and it was an initiatory magical system in which masons would go through a series of invoking angels and spirits to have the beatific vision, to have the vision of God, right? And then the next evolution was the CBCS, or the Rectified Scottish Rite. And that was developed by one of Pasquale's students. Um, I consider him to be the, the knight, like the initiated knight, the Templar knight. And he carried on Pasquale's vision in a Masonic sense. Uh, and that, that rite still exists today all over Europe and South America. Um, and then there's the last one, which most people identify Martinism as, which is Louis-Claude de Saint-Martin. And he actually never created a system. The system called Martinism was created over 80 years after his death by Gerard Uncas or Pappas. And it was an inspired system based upon him, uh, which he called the way of the heart. And you could, you could basically call it Buddhism of the West. Ooh, I like that description. I haven't heard that before. <laughs> So what aspects of, so I guess two part question, what aspects of Martinism in general appeal to you the most and of the, I guess the three Martinisms or the three schools in Martinism, which one appeals to you the most? For me, Martinism appeals to me because the way that I've experienced it, is that it has been a, a beeline, a direct path, a direct road with clear signs towards the mystery, or again, what I, we call the royal secret, um, being the rightful inheritance of man and the reality of the divine. So enlightenment, it's, it's a clear path for me to that. Cool. Uh, as far as my favorite version of Martinism, you know, Martinism, the three grades of Pappas, I think are the most effective. I think they're the most effective at bringing about this change in consciousness from lead to gold. But as far as being a geek <laughs> and really into history and studying, uh, the Elo Cohen is my favorite branch. Oh, cool. 
Yeah, from from what I've read of of Martinism, I, I've got a, a little bit of a fascination with uh, the CBCS grades. That's just I look at that and I go, man, that's so cool. Nightly mystic and, and masonry. Masons, yeah, masons will definitely love the CBCS. It taps into everything you're familiar with, but throws in that strong Templar tradition and mysticism, and has some real curveballs you're not going to expect. <laughs> Yeah, and for for any of our listeners that are wondering, there is a, a body of the CBCS slash rectified Scottish Rite uh, that is a Masonic body in the United States, but it's a kind of an extreme invitational body that's limited to like two hundred and thirty something people in the whole country. So hmm. there's well, not a lot of them out there. Is that the body in, in New York? No, they they kind of meet all over the place, really. So, but they right, divide. The, oh, go ahead, Billy. Well, no, I was going to say too. There, there's a word of warning about that. Not only is it extreme, super invitational to get into, but there is some conflict with the Grand Encampment of the Knights Templar of the United States right now. A little bit, uh, well, just it, a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's been ongoing, essentially, mm. uh, to the point to where if you if you continue your membership in that body. Uh, the, the Grand Encampment no longer recognizes you as a certain knight in good standing. Yeah. Oh, wow. The, well, there's uh, a lot of high-grade masons that are involved in that body, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how did you end up getting involved with Martinism? What, what drew you to it? Um, I kind of stumbled upon it, to be honest. Um, like all the best like things I, in life. Yeah. You know, like I said, if masonry masonry i like to say it's a gateway drug <laughs> um, and i got, i was blessed to meet some really good people and some really uh inspirational guys that led me down the right path and not all groups are created equal you know some you come into some martinist groups and you go through initiation but then that's it and it's it's more like freemasonry you know come back in a few months you get your next degree come back in a few months you're a master and I happened to come into a body that you had to work for a couple of years, like meditations, rituals, journals. Um, and I'm very, I was very blessed to have that happen. Um, and I thank our European brethren for that. That's pretty cool. Uh, so, I, was, I was actually going to ask, Martinist orders seem to be really active in you know, France, Spain, Russia, uh, Latin America. Are there any that are really active here? In the states, there are there, there's several orders active in the states. Um, the thing about the states is that for some reason Americans tend to want to be really hush hush about this tradition. Whereas if you speak French, it's literally all out there. <laughs> if you're in France, everyone's talking about. It. There's public conventions about it. If you're in Haiti, the entire city comes out for their ceremonies and their rites. You know, look it up on YouTube. Look up St. John's Day, Elu Cohen. Wow. And you'll, you'll see on the beach hundreds of people, hundreds of masons and tons of uh, muggles, so to speak. <laughs> all, all surrounded by a big fire doing Elu Cohen. Now, in the States, there are groups like the OMS, the Order Martinese Suvaran. Uh, they're Texas-based that are teaching all three branches. There's groups like the MOUP, uh, based out of Florida. There's groups like the Order Martinist. Um, there are, there's a lot, you know, I think in Austin, there's like three bodies. Wow. <laughs> that's months. a lot. So, so I recommend for anyone interested, just study on your own, read up and talk to people, see what feels right to you. Just like finding a, finding a karate school. Exactly. So, so I noticed when you go online and you actually look up Martinism, a lot of the websites that you come back, or that you pop up, um, refer to the same one, which apparently is really kind of controlled by the AMORC. Yeah, TMO. Yeah. AMORC. <laughs> yeah. So without getting too much into it, we can, if anyone's interested, they can email me. I'll send them some documents on that. TMO is huge, right? They're a. <laughs> 
they they engage in mail order systems essentially mm-hmm. which and, is and we'll, let's leave it there yeah okay yeah and that's kind of the amorc model anyways is yep. is that it's very much mail based mm-hmm. it's mail order and it is in my opinion is very surface now it's not necessarily that way in europe the tmo in europe and in germany i've met some really great german tmo people um but I just got to say, in America, I've not been impressed. And uh, I would just about say that any of Martinists I know would say that as well. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> you know, I, I, don't, I don't mail in my dues and just get a degree in the mail. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You don't get any hands-on experience. Mm-hmm. Yep. So let's talk a little bit about Rosicrucianism. So... Rosicrucianism, it's also a mystic form of Christianity. And most people in kind of who are exploring the deep end of the pool have probably heard of Rosicrucianism, right? Uh, I heard about it way before uh, I heard about Martinism. Uh, Most people that I know that talk about mysticism within the context of Freemasonry will almost always refer to Rosicrucianism uh, and never Martinism. Uh, how is Rosicrucianism different from Martinism? What is Rosicrucianism? What's the lowdown so, here? Rosicrucianism literally means the rose cross, right? The, the way of the rose and cross. So the symbols are a cross with a rose in the center. Aha, and very complicated. <laughs> yeah, very complicated. But even more specific, the gold cross and the red rose. Um, the gold cross representing the perfected man, you know, representing the Christ, um, and the rose representing Sophia or nature or wisdom, the heart of man opening itself up. Um, Rosicrucianism, the best sources for it are the original 1614, 1616, 1618 documents, respectively called the Fama Fraternitatis, the Confessio Fraternitatis, and the Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz. Uh, these are three anonymous documents that were published uh, in Germany over a period of six years or so, uh, four years, something like that. And they lay out the fraternity. And like we said earlier, their purpose was to heal the sick and pro bono. Like we said, masonry does a great job with its its institutions of uh, the hospitals and all that. I think the sickness that Rosicrucians are talking about is a spiritual sickness. It is the ignorance that bemires. It is the darkness of uh, unknowing. It is everything that is op- obfuscated. Um, and in my opinion, the Rosicrucian ideal is to bring knowledge, awareness, and spirituality to mankind again. And that happens nowadays, again, just like y'all said, Amorc. Amorc is the first name that comes up, but they're a mail order system. As far as initiatory systems, groups like the Rose Croix d'Orient over in France or the, uh, the, the Templar-based Isia, which uh, that, that uh, name means Knights of the Saints John, <laughs> the Evangelist and the Apostol- Apostolica. Uh, or the Frere d'Orient, the Brothers of the East. Those are, in my opinion, the real meat of Rosicrucianism. So what's the best way to start getting involved with or learning, or I guess reel it back a bit, not getting involved with, learning about Rosicrucianism or Rosicrucianism? I would pick up uh, Christopher McIntosh's book, The Rosicrucians. Uh, you can find that on Amazon. It's basically a, a general history of it. Uh, and he's also published a, you can find the Rosicrucian manifestos online for free, but he's also published them in a book called Rosicrucian Trilogy. I would, I would investigate the original documents, read those, and then um, really read The Chemical Wedding. If you haven't read it, it's like Alice in Wonderland. 300 years before it's time. <laughs> like, yeah, it's pretty wild. <laughs> yeah, it's an acid trip, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had to pick up on al- on alchemy. <laughs> I had to pick up I had to pick up the chemical wedding about I had to pick it up and put it down about 
three or four times because it was just like, all right, I'm I'm gonna go walk outside. I'm going to go play video games. I'm gonna go talk to a normal human being. I'm gonna you know, I'm gonna call my parents. I'm gonna see how they are. I don't know what to do with my life. <laughs> yeah, it'll melt your reality for sure. Yeah, yeah. So I know my first exposure to it was when I, I was in a similar situation. I was, I knew I wanted to be a Mason at 18 and I had to wait until I was 21 before I could petition. And so I, I grabbed books on just about everything I could get my hands on. And that's how I became exposed to the, to the Templars, uh, you know, the golden Dawn who was started by, you know, a bunch of brothers from who were in part of the SRA who, you know, Masons in England. Uh, but another one, one of them was Arthur Edward Waite. And he has a book called The Brotherhood of the Rosy Cross that touches upon, you know, a lot of those um, initial, uh, I guess, manifestos uh, talking about Rosicrucian are reprinted in that. And he has a lot of information about the history of the order. Yes. Yeah. Wait. And Wait was, like you said, Wait was also a member of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Um, if people don't know what the Golden Dawn was, that was a group founded by William Wynne Westcott who was Supreme Magist of the SRIA, which is a legitimate Masonic branch of Rosicrucianism, founded by Kenneth McKenzie. Um, so the history of Oat Grod, this brings us back to that for a sense. Like, why do people have Oat Grod masonry? It's because they're looking for more, right? They're looking for spirituality. They're looking for something that they haven't gotten in the lower grades. You know, that's why the SRIA was founded. Mm-hmm. And it was the first... Purely Masonic, well, not the first. It, it was a Masonic system that used the Tree of Life as a grade system. But then, you know, 30 years into it, they're like, yeah, it's still, it's not doing it. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> like, great, you know, we've got all the words, we've got all the grades, but we're still not there. It's still philosophical. It's not practical. Right. So, Westcott, Woodman, and Mathers founded the Hermetic Court of the Golden Dawn in 1888. Again, based on the SRIA and the Golden Rosenkreuz grade system of the Tree of Life. Um, And that was a Rosicrucian order that taught practical ceremonial magic and invocation. And it was kind of a trick because the outer order, you're learning magic. Mm -hmm. And then the inner order, all of a sudden, they flip you to Rosicrucianism. And you're like, yeah, you're a Christian mystic now. (laughs) So, So then would you say that the Golden Dawn is a Christian system? Oh, most definitely. Okay. I mean, despite the fact that it, it, it uses a lot of Egyptian symbolism. And oh, yeah. Shalding, but when you flip to the inner order, it is all Jesus Christ, INRI, and um, Christian mysticism. Hmm. So, you know, Wade is a member of that. His book is fantastic, um, as well as Paul Foster Case's The True and Invisible Rose Christian Order. Mm-hmm. But understand when you're reading those, you're basically reading them Christianizing the Golden Dawn. They're 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 further removing. They're basically just repackaging the Golden Dawn for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and that explains why the Golden Dawn, like a lot of their symbolism, is taken wholesale from SRIA. Yes. Yeah. The wands, all those kinds of things. Yep. The difference is they they put in practices. Mm-hmm. So we've talked about a little bit earlier on in the episode about Kabbalah or, you know, Kabbalah, however people want to say that. And with, and obviously people spell it with a K or a Q or a C at the beginning, just depending on where you are. Um, but Martinism and Rosicrucianism and obviously the Golden Dawn all make use of Kabbalah. What is Kabbalah? So let, let's quote a our past master, uh, Albert Pike. <laughs> and I know that that's a very broad question. <laughs> yeah, oh, it is. But, you know, Pike says that the Holy Kabbalah is the tradition of the children of Seth, carried from Chaldea by Abraham, taught to the Egyptian priesthood by Joseph, recovered and purified by Moses, concealed under symbols in the Bible, revealed by the Savior to St. John, and contained entire under hieratic figures analogous to those of all antiquity in the apocalypse of that apostle. Um, it is the secret tradition of Israel, 
of the Hebrews. It is an oral tradition, mouth to ear. The word Kabbalah means tradition. Uh, the root Kabel means to, 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 to hear or to speak. And the, the import is mouth to ear, just like how we re receive our catechism, right? Mm -hmm. uh, everything is master to student. The master gives the word and the student receives the word. <clears throat> um, it is the secret oral tradition of the Torah. Um, and it has been passed down in traditional Hebraic manners. And then around the 13th, 14th century, it became Christianized through the tarot. And a guy named Pico de la Marandola. And that's when you see the C Kabbalah. That's Kabbalah spelled with a C. That's like that version. Okay. It was the, the K is generally the kosher rabbinical Kabbalah. So that's going to be your ancient Jewish texts like the, the Zohar, the Sefer Yetzirah, the Bahir. Mm -hmm. um, if you see it with a Q, that's going to show that it is hermetic, meaning magical, initiatory. Um, things like the Golden Dawn, things like uh, alchemy are going to be involved in that. Um, one more thing from Pike. He said uh, in Morals and Dogma, he says, the Kabbalah is the key of the occult sciences, and the Gnostics were born of the Kabbalists. That's his uh, on the 28th degree. Interesting. That's pretty cool. That's that. And seeing that uh, through the history of masonry is, is really fascinating. Uh, what, you know, I, I, other than the ones, you know, like learning mouth to ear and stuff, what are some, I guess, um, uh, profane safe capitalistic yes. concepts that we see <laughs> reflected in Freemasonry? I would say almost everything, man. Um, <laughs> keeping it profound safe, <clears throat> the pillars, their names, their placements, everything about it, those are oh, yeah. extreme Kabbalistic myths, and those are the pillars of the Kabbalah. Um, the names of individuals you encounter in the third degree, um, the names of the placements of the officers, the symbols of wisdom, strength, and beauty. Um, all of those, wisdom, strength, and beauty, the three pillars of the lodge, those are the names of the tree of life, the pillars of the tree of life, mm -hmm. of the Kabbalah. Um, everything that has to do with the glory of the sun and the waxing of the moon, uh, it is, Kabbalah is intertwined into literally everything you've seen in both craft masonry and high grade masonry. What uh, books, courses, letter lessons, etc., would be best for a beginner trying to learn more about Kabbalah? The problem with Kabbalah is that you're literally learning a new language, right? Just like when when you start learning your EA catechism, sometimes people trip over it because they until they get the cadence, right? Uh, unless they've studied Shakespeare and then like they kind of get the cadence, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. Um, so with Kabbalah, you have to persevere because you're learning, you're literally learning Hebrew in a language. Um, I'm working on publishing a new book soon, which will be an, a, a publicly available text. Uh, if you're interested, I can send you all drafts of it. Welcomely just giving it out for free. Um, of course. I gave a oh. Yeah. And I gave a lecture at the Scottish Rite Collegium last week on that. And we'll be doing it again in, in uh, April, I think, for the class. Uh, but I'm trying to distill all this so that up until now, I think it takes about five books before you start understanding anything. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like that's you an investment read, right there. Yeah. You just got to read about five books. Then you're like, Oh, okay. I, I understand what Keter means now. Just a tiny too. one stage on, on the, on the uh, tree of life there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause you're learning such a vast thing. But the great thing about the Kabbalah is it's a filing cabinet. You know, you basically get 32 cabinets, just like the 32 degrees of masonry, in which you can categorize everything in existence, from all the gods of antiquity of every religion, to colors, to smells, to scents, to incenses, to alchemical substances. And I would recommend, shoot me an email, and I'll send you my text, and that gives me more people to proof it, too, to check it out. Um, beyond that, books like Robert Wang, The Kabbalistic Tarot, 
It is a book that will teach you the Kabbalah through the tarot, which gives you images. That way it's not just in your head with a word. Yeah. Uh, that was my first Kabbalistic book. Um, it's Knights, a practical guide to Kabbalistic symbolism. Um, and for advanced people, uh, Menzi Pade has recently translated the works of uh, Chaim Vital, which are the works of Rabbi Isaac Luria, in a book called The Tree of Life by Menzi Pada. So I would suggest those as places to start. Interesting. Uh, and it's interesting that you bring up the tarot too, because it is extremely Kabbalistic, right? Uh, because mm -hmm. the cards correspond to different paths on the Tree of Life uh, or Sephiroth. Um, so that that's, uh, I mean, to me, it seems like a fantastic way to to learn, especially from the beginning, because it does have visual images to go with it. Yep. One of the other books I'll be publishing this year to the public is going to be a book on the tarot on the tree of life, also applied to the, uh, the Shem HaMeferesh, the 72 fold name of God of the Israelites. Mm. <clears throat> wow. Yeah. Deep end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> show. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I could uh, honestly, we could have an entire episode about Kabbalah and, and have should. several. We will. It's coming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we got to ease into there, you know. We exactly. can't just drop people in that end. <laughs> Go in, tiptoeing. Yeah. yeah. From, from Martinism to Rosicrucianism to Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn to alchemy to the whole grab bag of everything else, we could do hours. And hours yeah. of um, discussion and interview, uh, but it's probably best at this point that we get to talking about uh, Texas Masonicon, right? Yeah, <laughs> right. it's it's time to start winding our own down. Yeah. So, all right, uh, brethren, if you haven't heard yet, uh, Texas Masonicon 2019 is going to be on Saturday, July 27th. It's going to be all day. Um, we have an early bird special going on right now. It's a limited number of tickets. Uh, that price is $55. It will go up after we sell out of the early bird uh, ticket pool. And, of course, Paul is the first speaker that we have uh, unveiled and are promoting for the event. <laughs> so, Paul, uh, can you tell us, is this, has this episode kind of been a teaser for the talk that you'll be giving, or do you have something more specific in mind for your talk at Texas Masonic Con. Uh, this episode is us just rapping about all kinds of stuff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I figured it was a little too general. <laughs> yeah, it, it was very general, you know, kind of like introduction to Oat Rod, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. Masonic Con will be, my lecture will be much more specific. Um, I specifically want to focus in on spiritual masonry in 1700s France. Ooh. Um, and take concepts from groups like the Elokelen, which is a magical Masonic order, and show how we can show, first of all, what they did, and then how we can incorporate some of those principles of Masonry into our understanding nowadays into our daily spiritual life. Oh, wow. So, bring your life vest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're going to be drowning in the deep pool. <laughs> that's awesome i can't yeah. wait i can't wait oh man that's great that is fantastic so uh, i'd like to include our fraternal quote of the week here and i figured it was topical but the quote is prayer is for our intellectual being what breathing is for our body and that's from Brother Louis Claude Samartan in his book *The Natural Table*, as translated by uh, companion Piers Vaughn. So uh, that is definitely on topic. Yeah, a <laughs> little bit. Well, I guess one of our topics that we covered. Yeah. So, uh, Rit and Billy, let's get some closing thoughts, and uh, then I'll go, and then we'll let Paul talk. I think the thing that stands out to me about the most about this episode and, and, and really when I met Paul was his focus and his drive for his niche. He clearly had found his drive in our fraternity and in life in general. 
And you could see he was a man with his, you know, with a focus. And he spoke that way. He knew what he was talking about, you know, and he spoke with energy and confidence. And it really, I mean, of course it impressed me, but it really got me to thinking about how important it is for every Mason to find their niche and go after it. In the world of masonry we have now to where it's like, okay, you're a master mason, and then all of a sudden you're flooded with Scottish Rite, York Rite, Shrine, join this, join that. It's so important that you find your niche and focus on that. Because if you do, you're going to be able to move mountains. I mean, Paul hasn't been a mason too terribly long, and he's been blazing a path. And it's because he found his niche, his drive. And that's that's what motivate motivates me the most because a lot of what you guys talked about tonight, right over my head. <laughs> but it was hard not to be inspired by the the zeal. Okay, yeah. So uh, I love the what you said earlier about uh, masonry is like a gateway drug. Um, <laughs> because there is so much more to it. Uh, yeah, I mean, masonry, the social aspect is fine. And if you join masonry just for the social aspect, you're no less of mason than anyone else, right? That's perfectly fine. But if you want to dig deep into it, just dive into that pool. There's so much mysticism. I mean, multiple different mystery schools that are wrapped up within the ritual that you never realize until you start studying you know, Kabbalah and, and, and the other traditions that have found their way into it. Um, so I, I personally am looking forward to your talk. Uh, you know, I'm I'm excited to get to talk about this, you know, because, uh, you know, again, you could be social, but I love digging into the what was on the mind of the guys who created the ritual initially 300 years ago. And I feel like this is, is a little bit closer to that source material. So, yeah, I, I'm definitely looking forward to it. Yeah, And I'd like to say that I am so crazy, crazy excited about uh, maybe masonry in general uh, and Texas masonry becoming ready. I don't know if we're ready yet, but I know I feel like we're becoming ready for high grade masonry. I mean, you know, we're no strangers to uh, the York Rite bodies and Scottish Rite and all that. It, so that's that's a very familiar form of high grade masonry. But man, I'm ready to get weird. So I mean, bring it on, y'all. <laughs> Paul, Paul, if you have any closing thoughts you'd like to leave with the listeners uh, and any contact info or anything you'd like to plug, feel free. You know, regarding what that that quote said, prayer is for intellectual being what breathing is for our body you know our bodies are need breath to stay alive if you don't breathe that's your drop point right mm -hmm. the breath is what generally connects us to our spirit in yoga traditions and in kabbalistic and gnostic traditions so when sam martin is saying that breath is that important for our body when he's saying that prayer is for our intellect the same as breath is for a body. He's saying that man without prayer, without aspiration, without desire is like a piece of wood adrift on the, the, the seas of life without a compass, without a rudder. And that it is only through pointing that compass to the eternal East that we find our true purpose and our call and our niche in life. So I just encourage all of us to, you know, study hard, pray well, and love well. <laughs> Amen. Awesome. <laughs> well, Side of the phone call, guys. Uh, oh, no doubt. I, you know, I think we've got uh, a full lineup of high energy. You know, it's going to be hard to leave this event and not be just jacked up on Mountain Dew. <laughs> yep. <laughs> or you could be like me and just not sleep well and be helping organizing it and have, just be in a delirious state afterwards. But we'll leave right. that to us. Yeah. Well, yeah, so, because the last Masonicon, I went home that night and I wrote like 12 pages, all of material that I thought of. Uh, and a lot of it was actually 
uh, after hearing Brad Billing's astronomical layout of the lodge, I started thinking about the Kabbalistic layout of the lodge in, in some of the different aspects of why we do what we do during our ritual has Kabbalistic, uh, you know, it, it has uh, some meaning behind it. So, you know, yeah, you, you may come home and, and find yourself doing like me and just writing out page after page of thoughts <laughs> that came to you during the event. It's no doubt. So, folks, if you want to learn more about the podcast, you can find or or about Fort Worth Lodge, which is actually probably the more important subject here. That you can reach us at www.fortworth148.org. We are at Fort Worth Lodge 148 on Facebook. Our email is info148 at fortworth148.org. And if you live in the 64th district of the Grand Lodge of Texas and you want to promote an event, please reach out to them at 64th.org. That's 64th.org. You can learn more about Texas Masonicon at www.texasmasonicon.com. That's texasmasonicon.com. We are at Texas Masonicon on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, my email is texanmason at gmail.com. And uh, Paul, do you have an email that uh, you'd like to leave with the listeners? Or Yes, people can contact me at uh, on Facebook, Paul Edward Rana, or Ninja Paul, N-I-N-J-A-P-A-U-L. I teach karate, right? NinjaPaul yeah. at gmail.com. Yeah, if you're interested in any of the topics we talked about, I would love to pass people preliminary readings and help you learn your Hebrew letters. <laughs> it's awesome. Well, I'll be emailing you. 22 days. I feel like I'm going to get beat up for being a nerd all over again. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why you come to me for boxing. Oh, there we there go. There you go. <laughs> well, all right. All well, it's been fun. You bet, gentlemen. Let's go ahead and shut this down. This is Rip Moore signing off. This is Billy Hamilton signing off. This is Gabe Yagish signing off. This is Paul Rana signing off. <laughs>